Yeah, I think so much of the spiritual journey goes for, you know, what Buddha said, Jesus, empty the mind, empty the mind, expose. But, yeah, that there comes a point, too, where, you know, that, 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 that old song, girls just want to have fun, spirit, it wants to have fun now. Spirit, you know, there's a part of us that just wants this to be fun. It doesn't want to be like pulling a teeth <coughs> out and struggling. And, and you know, it takes, it does take trust. We're not trying to say that it doesn't take trust, it doesn't take faith, but, but a lot of the spiritual journey, you know, I think through the mystics and saints and all the stuff that's been written all the centuries, I mean, if you read St. John of the Cross, if you read a lot of the mystics and saints, it just sounds daunting. Mm -hmm. It sounds like, oh, hell, I took the lid off of this thing called the shadow or the unconscious, and oh my God, OMG, oh, you know, it's daunting. And, and admittedly, if you had a lid on the darkness, we'll say, for millennium, and now, seemingly in the context of this life, you're going to go, not hiding anymore, not going to push it down, not going to fight against it. You know, it's it can seem to be interpreted by the ego as being very dark. I mean, the ego has a dark interpretation. It's a death wish, so it will interpret everything. Even your spiritual advancements, your great soaring experiences, it will interpret in very negative ways. It will say, oh, you shouldn't do this. Well, watch out for this and be careful. So, you know, we've taken a path. Our path is really not necessarily one of renunciation. I did have somebody, I did an interview with Japan the other night, and they prepared a few um, questions. And, and one of them was like, now that you've departed from your life in the world, you know, it, it, made, it sounded so... <laughs> sad, you know, but it hasn't really been sad at all. It was, it was when I, now that I've, you know, let go of convention and, and repetition and, and uh, kind of like the ways that are prescribed to follow a very joyful, spontaneous, moment by moment life, uh, they were saying, How, how's it going? I said, it's going great, and, and I did share that in the interview. But a lot of people see, because of the ego's belief, they see the journey to spirit as a very sacrificial journey. I mean, when they hear Buddha say, empty your mind of everything you think you think and think you know, there's a part of the mind that goes, I kind of like what's in my mind, you know, and parts of it I like, maybe. Parts of it I can let go, but parts of it I like, I don't want to let go. And so then the whole journey of emptiness, you know, which really is an emptiness, you know, it's actually... Christ is telling us, no, it's actually fullness. There's a vibrant, full light and love and joy that's in your mind that's natural. So when you loosen from these other goals and pursuits, which are always in the future, uh, and start to adopt a present goal, which is peace of mind, which none of us were trained for a present goal. We think that's crazy. Present goal? Well, that's crazy. Who's what gibberish is that? Goals are, of course, goals are always in the future. But no, there actually is a present goal that's that's actually possible when we do give up our ambitions, when we give up our desire to change the world and strive and achieve. You know, it's actually quite joyful not having any ambition. To have zero ambition. It's not it's not actually lazy. It's the ego will interpret it as lazy, but it's actually very relaxing to be content. You know, to be very, very content. Mm. So this movie is, is something Jason put together, and it's it's quite a, a kind of like a, a focal point of a lot of the themes we've been talking about today around roles, family roles, and and that idea of leader follower, and all those kind of things that seem to be sticking points. Yeah, we both have a lot of ambition that has to be undone. Yeah, it's, it's, you're talking about ambition. It feels like for me, I've taken all the ambition I had in the world and applied it to the spiritual journey. And now, I'm coming to this place, and it's like that just does not work. You know, I get sucked into these vortexes for like a couple hours, and I still hear a voice every once in a while, like should be doing something or whatever. But 
it's just everything is so backwards to what I'm used to, what we're used yeah. to. You know? Jason's made these mini movies, amazing, helpful mini movies, for for years, and and Jeffrey and Jason went to this the largest spiritual film festival, conscious film, conscious film festival in the world, and they were there for a while, and uh, they were like, yeah, yeah, we're just good. we're here, we're. We're attending, we're participating, and finally Lisa Fair was like, come on, you guys, own it. You're filmmakers. You tell people when they say, what are you doing here? You say, we're filmmakers. You know, you're filmmakers. And so they... At the end of the end of the weekend, we had this lady came up and she said, I've been praying for months, you know, and I finally feel like you guys are my producers. You should, you want to produce my movie? <laughs> Jeffrey's like, we'll pray on that. They got a job, <laughs> they got a job offer. <laughs> own it, own it. But you just, they just haven't been doing it in conventional ways. Jason's made many, too many to mention all these amazing tools. And he's just using the work of many other people, <laughs> people the Wachowski brothers and many others <laughs> and so forth. But it's like really to make these really tool, strong tools. And now it's we are getting uh, offers. I got back and a woman from... Uh, friend of mine from Hollywood and a producer friend of hers who make major Hollywood movies they're like we want to make a movie of Helen Shuckman's life and put Meryl Streep in it and all you know and I'm, I'm like okay I don't know if Meryl's short enough to <laughs> play <laughs> Helen's like five foot two but you know there's all kinds of movie things seem to be coming in with that vibe yeah, now yeah and I'm I'm a writer now. <laughs> <laughs> You're a writer. <laughs> I told them the story. You told the whole story. <laughs> yeah, this cost them probably $100 million. It cost us 50 to edit it a little together. So we have to use Hollywood because our budget's a lot shorter. <laughs> okay, so tonight's movie is really about we love the father and son kind of analogy. And they really believe that they're a worldly father and son. And so this movie is about taking them into the experience of being being their true self, their true son of the greater father. And they have to let go of their roles of being a dad and a son in order to do that. And so just like in that song with Judas and Jesus, Jesus was saying to him, this is all for you. This movie is all for the two of them to undo everything. So they all the drama and all the tigers and the wild animals and the rough situations if you can just see that as a symbolic representation of the darkness in the mind that is arising as they let go of the hierarchy that they have together yeah we're going to pause it a lot too so and what were you telling me nikita there was this, a couple themes too like i'm kind of blank so it doesn't have a lot. Is the mother in it or in this version, or a little bit? She is. Yeah. She is okay. She's like the soft voice of joining and yeah, coming back. She tells the son early on, okay, like you know, support your father. He's doing his best. And then she tells the father, stop being a father, stop being a general, and be a, a dad. Basically, symbolically, start to let your your heart open up. So she sends them off with the guidance, but little do they know what's coming their way. And this also has guidance, too, because what happens, you're going to see, is the ship crashes and the father can't walk anymore. And so he can only, he wears a headset like this to communicate with his son, a little more sophisticated, and basically gives him all of this guidance because he can see the bigger picture of everything. So that's just like the Holy Spirit in our lives where he absolutely sees everything. And if the son wasted his time saying, why? You know, he'd get eaten by a lion. I cut out all the eating part, eating scenes. So you have to just imagine that this is very focused and intense. And if he follows the guidance exactly, he kind of gets out. Very precise. We love precision with this stuff. Yeah, and, and the only times that he wants to not tell his father what he's doing or hide or protect something, you know, is it still comes back to that autonomy and, and feeling I know better and uh, that does tend to waste time when the mind's kind of in a very much of a uh, 
trying to be the authority and so on and so forth. So it's really they're both joining in learning to join in a purpose that, that frees them both instead of sticking with the, the roles. And that does fit in with a lot of what was being shared today. If you feel you're stuck in caretaking relationships, you're stuck in partnerships, you're stuck uh, to kind of bide your time on earth and play out, you know, fulfill your role and so on and so forth, it helps to have a context that that all of the roles were made up by the ego and the Holy Spirit has to unwind the mind from those and take it into the atonement or the correction, which is bringing you back to yourself as a spiritual being. And uh, the ego was going to scream sacrifice and, and all at every turn. So it's not so much that you let people go, it's more like you, you outgrow certain self-concepts because all the self-concepts were made by the ego and if you get to the end of the text in A Course in Miracles Jesus will say salvation is nothing more than the escape from concepts and says that the Holy Spirit is the one that will exchange self-concepts so the Holy Spirit knows that you have to go higher and higher in awareness and so if you find yourself well I, I thought I was this, this, this but I feel less like this and this you start to find yourself in more flexible, expansive <coughs> roles. You go, oh, I, I like this. There's more breathing room here, and this feels much more natural than what I was just doing. That's the Holy Spirit in your mind, exchanging self-concepts. The whole tablecloth isn't ripped out. You're not hurled into reality. You're not hurled into abstraction. You're given, oh, try this one. Now try this. Now try this. And the Holy Spirit's job is to exchange the self-concepts to take you higher and higher towards your last self-concept, which is forgiveness. Why is forgiveness the last self-concept? <laughs> because it's the one self-concept that you can wholly share with everything and everyone. It's forgiveness. It's like a blanket of light that goes over the whole planet, the whole cosmos. That you can share. That's a very expansive self-concept, and Jesus was a representation of that self-concept. He it was agape love. He, he loved everyone and everything because he wasn't holding on to a personal, individual self-concept. Before <laughs> Abraham was, I am. You know, it was everything he spoke was for the whole universe. Imagine that every word you speak is for the entire universe. It's spoken with such love and graciousness and beneficence because he's not speaking for a man or a woman. He's not speaking for... This culture, that culture, this race, this ethnicity, he's speaking every word is for the entire cosmos. Because you're ready to let go of the entire cosmos and go back to your divine light, your being. So that's amazing. There's also another line in The Course in Miracles in the workbook where he says, everything you think, say, and do teaches all the universe. <clears throat> everything you think and say and do. Because you're the Christ, and that's why everything you think, say, and do teaches all the universe. You see how different that is than thinking, I'm just a human being, one among billions, I have my own little private mind with my own little whirling thoughts, and those little thoughts don't matter because I'm just one tiny piece of the puzzle, and it's not a really always a good piece, you know, it's a struggling piece, and the, the whole cosmos is going on without me. One day I'll die, and it'll just keep rolling on through time like it's been. No, Jesus says in the, the course, in the workbook, he says, when, when you came to this world, you brought the world with you. This is quantum. You didn't come as a soul into a pre-existing world that had been existing for thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of years. You brought it with you. When you came, you unpacked the whole thing. You know, it's that's quantum. It's the ego that would convince <coughs> us that we're just one tiny little soul that incarnated for its learnest little lessons, maybe move on to another lifetime, and then yet another, yet another. But he says in the Course, when you came, you brought the world with you. I always use the example of like you're a soul flying around with a soul with a backpack. And when you land, you open your backpack up and you unload the whole cosmos. <laughs> <laughs> exactly as you wish it to be. 
You want to be a victim? You can pull out the big victim story. If you want to want to be a, a king, a queen, whatever, you you. Every, the world is exactly as you set it up according to the ego, and we're here to transcend that limited view of our very being. We're more. <laughs> so yeah, any other questions before we start? Anything burning? It's a lot of pressure when you say burning. But... <laughs> okay. He's believed to be so completely free of fear that to an Ursa, he is invisible. This phenomena is known as ghosting. That's what we're training to be. Ghosters. <laughs> <laughs> Miracle workers. So completely free of fear that nothing of the ego can reflect itself back to us. And the Ursas, Ursas it's like the sentinels, you know, in, in the Matrix. And they're, they're basically blind, but they can sense fear. They can like sense it. So, you know, we know that experience if, with a lot of times with animals. If you are fearless and open-hearted, the animals will reflect that fearlessness and open-hearted with the great connection. But if you show fear around a horse, if you show fear around a dog or lots of animals, go out, show fear around a bear, show fear around a snake, you know, then that reflection of that fear comes back as a symbol of an attack acted out on the screen of the world. So, in this sense, you know, the the rangers, the leader of the rangers, we saw a clip of Will Smith just kind of walking him out right next to this big person, this thing that's just devouring and killing humans and just slitting its throat because you have to have a sense of fearlessness and it, that relates to our waking up to our true reality. <laughs> We're not going back into the experience of heaven and nirvana with fear. <laughs> We've got to empty our minds of, of fear. And we have, to, we have to have a guide inside that knows the way to navigate through that and take us to a fearless state of mind. And in, in A Course in Miracles, one of the lines that's so powerful is Jesus says, Make your invulnerability manifest. You know how a lot of teachers talk about in this journey, be vulnerable, be vulnerable. They're really just saying, be okay with showing your emotions, don't try to hide things, don't try to protect things. But ultimately, where's all that going? It's going to make your invulnerability manifest. Make your fearlessness manifest. Demonstrate to yourself and to the whole universe that you're afraid of nothing. And that has to come from mind training, from releasing grievances and attack thoughts. You're not going to be fearless if you have attacks and judgments going on in your mind. You'll just have plenty of fear and it'll just be drawn to you in a cycle, like a closed system, where you feel powerless and helpless, like I'm never going to get out of this. You know, I'm never going to conquer or overcome these fears. But this is a great movie for that. So he's got all this ambition, you can see. It's just driving everything because he wants this approval from his father. We're going to get in touch with a story that I'll tell you right now, where his sister died because an Ursa came in, and he was hiding under a glass jar. And because of that, like if you've heard of post-traumatic survivor's guilt, like veterans that come back from war, they lived and their brothers didn't. They can call it survivor's guilt. But basically he feels responsible that he's alive and she's not. And so he's constantly trying to make up for this guilt that's in his mind by doing the right thing. So that kind of sounds like what we're doing with we feel guilty that we separated from our source. And it's so buried deep in there, we're constantly trying to do things to make up for it. And that doing is based on the ego. And so we're just giving our lives over to the spirits doing to undo that. So they're about to take a Holy Spirit journey. So it's like you know, as you go through experiences on planet Earth, you you may have experiences that seem to bring up that intense fear. If anybody's ever had a life-threatening illness or, or a heart attack or a near brush with death with an automobile crash or, or maybe you find yourself on one of the tallest buildings of the world and you're at the overlook on the top 
and you get up there and you put your arms and it's you know it's there's big things around you and everything and you kind of lean over and you feel this swishy feeling in your stomach like ooh, like just the anticipation of falling off in your mind your mind just plays out a few thoughts of that's a long drop there <laughs> and you start to feel a little queasy those are all that's all there's fear under there and it's fear that's associated with the bodily identity the spirit's never afraid but it's a fear of loss loss of life loss of a friend's life you know it, you know, you may even have that in, in a breakup with a, a relationship, a, a husband, a wife, a, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, where you see this pit in your stomach, like a devastation, like the one thing in your life that had meaning has now been taken away, and it's just this deep pit of, of sadness or loneliness or fear or shame or guilt or whatever. So what happens is, that fear has projected out a world in which you seem to be a person. In this case, we have a father-son relationship. But the one thing that is obscure in all these earth relationships is perfect equality. Even with father-son relationships, you know, we're told, you know, children are to be respectful of your elders. Doesn't it say that in the Bible? Honor thy father and thy mother. Well, but what about the father and mother? Honor thy, where's that honor thy child part <laughs> in there as well? What we're missing is perfect equality. <laughs> what we're missing is a sense of such a deep love that there's there's honor, there's respect, there's listening, there's intuitive guidance. And you can see already in their relationship, the mother has kind of pointed out what each one needs. You know, he needs a, a father with a heart. And and the father needs to begin to lighten up and, and tune into what's most truly helpful to let go of whatever the roles are. The father seems to be this experienced, revered warrior, and the son's trying to chase that, to be a cadet and to kind of take on that position. But there's you see what it is? There's so much inequality. There's so much roles. And it's all tied into past learning. It's all tied into what what they believe is important, the values, and they are egoic values that are obscuring perfect equality. And so what happens, what they're about to go through, and what goes, goes around in this world is we seem to have a lot of extreme conditions that just keep coming at us over and over and over for a whole lifetime, trying to knock the superior, the inferior out of us. Wash it out of us, cleanse it out of us, you know, rinse it out of us. In fact, one time I had a, a group of women in um, South America, in Argentina, that were mothers that were that were had very young children, and they were having they were so poor that they could just xerox like pages from a from Cursa de Milagro. They couldn't afford to buy the book. They would xerox. <coughs> pages of Incursa Milagros to to get the wisdom from Jesus and practice. And they did tell me, they said, we're learning so much from our young children. We're learning so much every day from our young children. That are these, these little ones are teaching us so much. And I said, can you summarize the teaching of the, the little children? And they said, oh yeah. The way the mothers summarize the teaching of the little children was you're done. <laughs> That's what the little children were teaching him. You're done. This game of superior and inferior is done. Just because you have a bigger body doesn't mean you're the boss of me. <laughs> you're not. <laughs> we have a source in which we have our being and we're perfectly equals. It doesn't matter how tiny my body is. It doesn't matter whether my brains develop. It doesn't matter about education. It doesn't matter about skills. It doesn't matter about anything at all in this world. None of it means a damn thing because we're equals. We're, we come from the same source. So basically, the, the mothers were thrilled to tell me the wisdom of the little children. You're done. And that does remind me of Jesus at one point in the Course. He says, resign now as your own teacher. You've been poorly taught. You're teaching yourself that you're a human being based on your past learning. 
Cuban, poorly taught, resign now as your own teacher, and let the wisdom of the universe show you how loving you truly are, and equal. You're not better than, and or are you worse than? And your skills and abilities and everything you've learned from the ego doesn't make you better or worse, even with all of that. It's much ado about nothing. So this is a great movie for that because based on past learning, the father seems to have a role, the son has a role, the son's trying to emulate the father, but but in ways that actually are not going to be helpful at all. And they both have have so much pride and so much ambition that has to be washed out of them. And it's going to take seemingly a set of circumstances that they're going to have to face together to do that washing. And that's when you think of it, that's what we're all going through. It's, it's a very humbling journey. Very, very humbling. So he's very intuitive. Remember he put his ring up there? He can feel things. And so that's going to be used by the spirit to undo the pride. He's in touch with the presence. And these guys are like, how? How do you know that? He doesn't even answer them. He's just like, <laughs> he's like move on here. Because <laughs> there's a graviton story coming. And, and they're basically saying, like, the chances of that are once in a million. Like, it's dismissed yeah. right away. And he's got a, a look of, no, we need to pay attention to this because this mass expansion could happen. And that could mean... In a matter of minutes, we could be in the middle of an asteroid yeah. storm. So it's an intuition yeah, coming in. I like it. Past learning says, sir, it's one, one, in, one in a million. They think he's wrong. He's not wrong. <laughs> so this is what a hyper jump looks like. He, I cut out a lot of scenes here, but basically, they're not going to make it. Their only chance is to do this jump through time and space. And, but not knowing where their coordinates are going to end up because they don't have time. So it's like a, a leap of faith again. And remember, because they prayed to heal this ambition, they're going back to Earth. <laughs> like all of us. <laughs> well, remember, has any of you have seen the, the movie uh, Revolver? Yeah. It's, it's basically... Uh, I call it a gangster movie to wake up. It's it's an enlightenment gangster movie. So if you if this gangster can wake up, yeah. and you can too. <laughs> uh, and it's Guy Ritchie uh, it was Madonna's ex husband uh, who made it. And but there's a line in that movie which is where you don't want to go, that's where you'll find him. Your fears, you know, the things that you're afraid of in this world. Certain people you just want to avoid, like, I hope I never see them again in my entire lifetime. You say that, and the Holy Spirit's like, hmm. Okay. The things that you're most afraid of, where you don't want to go, that's where you'll find him. Him, the ego. The ego hides under familiarity and comforts and conveniences. He wants it to be nice and cozy in this world wants to be nice and sound asleep and covered over so the light will never find its way through. And that's what this kind of is, is where you don't want to go. So they basically have escaped Earth, and they've got their own training center and their own place where they live far, far away from Earth. And now this leap is going to take them back where they can't even imagine going, back to an... A, an uninhabited planet that basically danger. Uh, da the most dangerous planet in the cosmos because all there are, are Ursa and you know and all types of creatures that have developed since human beings left that kill humans. So it's the worst place for humans to go is back to Earth. That's like way in the past, you know, like we don't have to go back in history. It'd be like going back to the days of the dinosaurs. Uh, how am I going to navigate a dinosaur? <laughs> I got high blood pressure, a little too much cholesterol. And oh, by the way, there are dinosaurs that are right in these uh, trees. And, uh, you know, it could, you hear, a, the earth starts to shake, boom, 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 boom. Jurassic Park? No, Calgary. You know, it would be like having, having dinosaurs still around. That's what it's like going back to Earth in this movie. <laughs> Having fun. It's funny too because 
the beginning of the movie, they said that it was their fault that they had to leave Earth. They did something to the planet, so they had to leave. And it's like a lot of things. Like we're actually working with this director who won an Oscar nominated. There's won an Oscar for the documentary. documentary that she made, and she's a little bit afraid to come back and be a director because she left it because there were some unhealed things. And so now the spirit's like with us bringing in this documentary again. She has to use what she left behind, like what wasn't finished. So these guys have some. I don't know what you want to call it. Racial, not racial. Species guilt around what they did to the Karmic. planet. Karmic. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, there were, so they got to go right back into the core of that as well. And face it. And it's, you know, it's, uh, their ship is falling apart <laughs> with damage. So they have to land somewhere. Find me something to land on. So this is where it's landing. Warning, warning. <laughs> He recognizes it. <laughs> it's like, oh no. That relationship you wanted to get away from. See, see, that's so beautiful scene. Right before he got thrown away. <laughs> well, that's too bad. Because look, that's what we call linking up. Like, This is the value of community, of coming together. Because we all don't have the same fears at the same time. So when it's coming up for somebody else, you can be that one that walks them through it and links it up as long as you're not in the hierarchy thing in the superiority stuff and then next day or next week it just flips you know your stuff's coming up and the other one's holding it so I just find that's what we mean by linking up that scene right there you know it's beautiful when he said like do exactly what I say and we will survive basically like there's a precision leave your husband at this time or take this new job at this time right when you've got enough momentum and courage to do it and if you try to do it on your own <laughs> that. He doesn't like that you're talking. No. <laughs> the bear. <laughs> okay, I'll keep playing. <laughs> so he's still got this ambition. He's trying to show his father how good he is, but he broke four of them running away from some monkeys. So he's only got two left. And so he's got to keep going. That's an example of people pleasing. Where you're trying to please someone, you want to tell them what they want to hear, rather than what is the truth. And amazingly, in human relationships, there's a lot of it. Telling people what they want to hear, telling bosses what they want to hear, telling parents what they want to hear, telling children, telling teachers what they want to hear. Not helping anyone, because it's, there's a fear around speaking it. What was the John Mayer, Mayer song? Say what you need to say. You know, we have to be to the point where we can disclose things. And and if we have fear around saying certain things, we have to face those fears. That's what it's meant to do. We're meant to speak up. We're not meant to keep stuffing it, swallowing our words, pushing things down, repressing. You've got issues with a partner? you got to say it. Got issues with a parent? Say it. Issues with a child? Say it. You have to disclose things because this trying to walk around on eggshells and dance around things like that, that isn't going to work. It actually slows down the healing. There's a dishonesty. There's a deception. And you could see when he first asked him and he gave the false number, you could see his heart rate. His father was watching everything. You could see the heart rate. Imagine if in all your relationships you had biofeedback hooked up to <laughs> your partner. I think I'm going on a trip. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> you know, why are you? So, why is your heart rate going up? I just said I'm going on a trip. What does that mean for you? What are you interpreting? I'm saying. Imagine if you had biofeedback hooked up to stress every time your stress level started to go up. Not even around words, but just around situations. You know, so there's meaning. I have given everything I see, all the meaning it has for me. There's interpretations that are disturbing. There's not actual events, actual people, actual things in the world that are disturbing us. I'm never upset for the reason I think. Jesus teaches us in number five. It's interpretations in our mind. We're upsetting ourselves. The world's not upsetting us. Partners never upset us. Nothing does, but, but when we start interpreting things in a guilty, fearful way, 
we need to get in touch with the thoughts and the feelings and the beliefs that are underneath those interpretations so that we can choose a new interpretation with the Holy Spirit and see that it's fearless, that there's nothing really to be afraid of. So it's, this is really a great teaching-learning relationship that's going on here. Can you see all that? There's, there's, he has to jump. He has to jump to use two two roots. Only one of them is a viable one if he jumps. But his father's got some protectionism in here, so you're going to see his response. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is very much like your spiritual journey. You will, get to, you will get to a point where you have the voices of the past, orders, protectionism, everything, and there will come a leaping off point where you will have to just say, I'm not a coward, and go, and you can see he's willing to just risk, face, it risk it all and face what it is. And it seems to be going against his father, but it, now he's intuitive that I can make it with two of those breathing vials. But it's really, this is quite similar to the spiritual journey, where the voices of the past are trying to hold you back. And you have to go with your intuitive trust. You can't let anything hold you back. And you can see that in the, if you really study the lives of the mystics and the saints, you know, everything from Mother Teresa, St. Francis, all the way down the line, you see they all come to these leaping off points where their devotion to find and experience the divine is more important to them than their fears, their past fears. And the ego is generating all the past fears, saying you can't make it. It said, look at each, what are your chances? You look at the few that have tried <laughs> and how it went for them. You think you're going to succeed where they failed? You know, that's the kind of mentality that you, you face. <laughs> what you thought was an enemy. You end up in a nest. <laughs> That just the bird thought he was one of its babies. So he's trying to bring him back to the nest. And some lion cub came and killed all the other babies. So that's all there. And he's, he's lost his communication link because he's trying to go past the hierarchies. So he can't talk to his dad anymore. Well, that's very symbolic, too. He takes the leap and he loses the communication link to dad. And now he's really got to be intuitive because he's trusted. And it's worked out. Yeah. But now he, he's, he's got to go even further. That's why with the Course, you know, I mean, people talk about they'll study the Course for 30 years, 40, 50, 60 years. You know, the, the Course actually is, you have to get weaned off the Course and weaned off of every spiritual path into your authentic listening. Of course. Of course it has to go that way. Because, you know, I had a woman one time who came to me and she studied, uh, what was the guy named uh, David Hawkins, the kinesiology, you know, and all this and this. And she was using pendulums, you know, where she would, she would ask and trust the pendulum to get all her answers from the Holy Spirit. And I, I said, that's great. And then she, she became horrified one day when she asked her pendulum for the answers and the thing just laid there <laughs> <laughs> after moving for her. For years telling her her answers, what to do and what not to do, she calls me up and she goes, oh my God, I think I've lost it. I said, what have you lost? And she said, my pendulum is just staying straight down. It's been moving for years, telling, guiding me and everything. She said, this is horrible. I said, no, no, it's not horrible. She said, what does it mean? What does it mean? I said, now you have the ability to hear and feel internally. You don't need... <laughs> A swinging pendulum. And he's he doesn't have the arm piece and the, the ways of communicating, but he doesn't need it anymore. It's never a, a sense of loss. Winter comes really quick. It drops like five degrees an hour or something. It keeps going. So his sister came as a symbol in his mind because he needed to wake up or he would just have frozen to death. So that's now the symbol. Instead of his father speaking to him, it's just a symbol in his mind. Yeah. Bird's motherly instinct is to care for one, pull it out of the cold. It's like we get these things on the, on our journey too. People that show up just at the right time, 
things that happen to us is we really are going for God. We don't even know how we're going to make it in the world. The circumstances turn in, faith, in our favor. Because that's, that's God's will that we wake up and you know, like you said, angels, it's like that bird is like twice now. Yeah. Take him to the nest and take take him out of the cold. It's like Jesus watching us sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> You've got the beacon, but you're just not quite in the right position. You need to be a little higher before the beacon can be used. So instead of t- going into a tirade and whole oh, thing, my life is a wasteless piece of shit. <laughs> Nothing works right for me. I'm getting nowhere. Da, da, da. Jesus is like, well, we need to go to higher ground here <laughs> to, to activate this. <laughs> Please, Bliss, we have more instructions to go. <laughs> Some fear to face. <laughs> Some more fears. To An Ursa on the loose, too. The ego on the loose. The closer you get to the escape, the ego is loose. Senses fear. Yeah, he hasn't faced the core yet. He's still got. He's still trying to prove to his dad he can do the right thing, and he's got to let go. And in this movie, they use like almost dying. You know, if you've had like a near death experience where you let go of everything in your life, you know, somehow that's close. So he hasn't had his yet. Take him. Ah, spooky action at a distance. <laughs> that the electronics aren't working, but he said, "Take a knee," and the power. Of- a prayer is coming in. This is quite symbolic of the spiritual journey because the ego will try to to scare you along the journey with thoughts of fearful outcomes and fearful things in the world. You know, when you look at, uh, when they've done psychological studies at the high stressors, death of a loved one, loss of a job, you know, all the things that are the highest stressing things for human beings, they're all external events. And what the, we're learning from A Course in Miracles is there are no external events. There is nothing outside of your mind. Like it's, it's a labyrinth, it's a maze of false thoughts and beliefs. The ego is going to try to scare you into giving up and just go back into the past. Go back, follow the masses, follow the herds of symbols that are just trying to survive. What, what are the billions of people in this world seeming to do but survive? They're trying to live another day. They're trying to keep their hearts beating. They're trying to survive. But there's more to life than survival. There's actually forgiveness and spiritual awakening that's what this is all about. The ego is just projecting it out as if there's all these things that can end your life. But you have to go much, much deeper to start to realize that what seems to be physical death isn't an end at all. It's just more of a continuation. The mind that can make a body can make another body, and another body, and another body. Some people call that reincarnation. You know, you can keep playing it out, this bodily survival thing, over and over and over. All these are generated memories in the mind. And all these seeming lifetimes are just generated memories, and they're all false memories. And as long as you keep thinking that's the game to survive in, in bodily form, and not have your heart open, and not have your mind cleansed, and not reach forgiveness, then it's just putting your attention and your care in all these memories. And the whole point of this mind is doing this with these memories, is that it thinks that there's good memories and there's bad memories, But the thing is, that's a projection of the split into the mind. Even the good memories and the bad memories are part of the game. Because there's the the good dreams and the bad dreams. What's, What's the problem with good dreams and bad dreams? Is that Jesus says, the dreams that you think you like can hold you back as much as those in which the fear is present. So if you're just trying to do the law of attraction, create your own reality and create some good memories, then those good memories, you could become attached to those, but you'll just keep regenerating those and try to avoid the negative ones and generate the positive ones. And it doesn't get you out of the loop of karma. It doesn't get you out of time. It just keeps you stuck in the loop, 
trying to maximize the good ones and minimize the bad ones. Accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative, and you go nowhere, you're still stuck in time, like a fly stuck in glue, like a fly stuck on flypaper. It's so, we've got a lot of different tools, I'm thinking of Time's End, one of Jason's movies of showing that, and in this sense, you know, there has to be something more than, than falling for these fear things. I mean, it looks like he's, he's telling them to run right now, but, but ultimately this is all just a metaphor from don't run away from looking within and facing your thoughts and beliefs. That's what the goal of meditation is. That's what the goal of introspection is. That's what the goal of, of contemplation is. All the pathways that the mystics and saints have used for centuries are there still for us. But the ego will try to make up all kinds of distractions to have you abort the mission. The ego wants you to abort the awakening mission at all costs. And what this is doing is it's saying, no, don't abort. Keep coming inside. So it's quite a metaphor here. He's, he's, he's going down into a cave now. It's a good metaphor to face the deep, deeper yeah. stuff. So it's like, as I was saying, fear attracts fear. As long as you have fear thoughts in the mind, you cannot help but experience interpreting the dream as if there's, there's something fearful in the dream that can get you. Just like a, a child who's having a nightmare of like a dragon, we'll say, or a monster is chasing it. And no matter what the child does, as long as he's still afraid of that monster, he will keep having recurring dreams of that monster chasing him until perhaps he turns around and he faces the monster head on. So the monster isn't this thing that's coming chasing him. He has to face it. And you might say that was some of you, did any of you see the Matrix movie? where basically uh, Neo is running from the agents, dodging bullets, and the agents are always after him, you know. In fact, Cypher says, whatever you see an agent, you do what we do, run. Because as long as the fear is in the mind, you will still keep reacting and responding to the images, as if they're fearful. Tornadoes, tsunamis, starvation, all the things of this world, germs, you know, weapons, on and on and on, burglars, on and on, terrorists, it just goes on. But, if you get to the point, like he, remember he said in this movie, when he was laying there, it was raining, he said, Dad, what did you do when you first ghosted? When you first went into presence? When you first weren't afraid? Because he, the son knows that that's got to be the answer, is, is being free of fear. And his dad said, well, he was down, he described the whole thing, and he was watching the blood go up in the sunlight, and he said, isn't that pretty? Blood, when blood became pretty, that was the moment that he was not identified with the, with the body. The blood was pretty. It's a pretty color with the sunlight. It was just a gazing upon something. So you can see that that's, this movie is running parallel to what we're talking about. We have to get to the point where we face the fear within the mind. And then the world will just reflect back our state of mind. But as long as we have fear within that we haven't looked at, then the world will just keep acting it out. Because that's what it was made to do, It's just to act it out. So at this point, he's still like running from the agents. He's, yeah. <laughs> the Ursa is the agent. <laughs> he's still going for the goal of enlightenment and light and the beacon, but he has to actually go towards the monster, like the opposite direction, look at the blocks. So it's like when you're, when you're fearless, when you're guiltless, when you know your strength, when you know your invulnerability, then the ego can't see you, but the ego can't even smell you. When you want to transcend the ego, go into your strength where it can't even smell you. How could it attack you when it can't even smell you? It doesn't even, it can't. The ego can't recognize the Christ, and who you are is the Christ. So if you go into the strength, true empathy, your invulnerability, your divine being, your spirit, there is no ego. There is nothing to conquer. There is nothing to transcend. There is nothing to battle. It's, it's simply that. 
the ego, ego can't smell you. Of course, the ego is blind, but it, but it's still in this movie. It still was sniffing, you know, and and there's a lot of fear with that sniffing. It could it could sniff fear, but it, without that fear, your invulnerability is there. And then, isn't it great? Wasn't that a beautiful symbol with the father in the end? The saluting. There wasn't any more that arrogant. I'm the father. You're the son. I'm better than you. You're not a ranger. Da 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 da. da. All of that was gone. It was just equality. That's what what comes from the fearlessness. You you know your own strength, and therefore you can recognize it in everybody else. And you don't you don't have to be better than anybody. You don't have to be lording over anybody. You know, in this world we have jobs and we have hierarchies in terms of. Who's the bosses? Who are the superiors and everything? How how absurd to think that our reality involves superiors and inferiors. That that our reality involves answering to people. Has anybody in this world had a job where you were in a were in a management position? That's supposed to be an advance over over being a factory worker. <laughs> but anybody tried it out? Managing is hell. <laughs> managing is stressful. <laughs> Trying to get people to control people and have people do what they're supposed to do, to come to work and do these things for the pay that they receive and the benefits and trying to keep people, you know, management is hell. <laughs> management is supposed to be the thing you advance to. And then when you get there you go, something is tricky, something's fishy about this whole setup because if management is so stressful, then it must not be, that's not, must not be my divine reality. So, so we're just here to see the perfect equality, and what a beautiful scene with them two, just acknowledging each other. Yeah. I want to go work with mom. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> we share the same purpose now. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I love it. That was exhausting. <laughs> that was exhausting. <laughs> it, was, it seems exhausting, but really this, the lesson is simple. Don't lead, I may not follow. Don't follow, I may not lead. Walk beside me on the self-same road and hold my hand. Or we go together to our source. You know, that's, I mean, it's really, really, really just one simple lesson. It's perfect, perfect equality. We're not going back to oneness until we can at least get the perfect equality down. Then we can let go of the parts. Then we can let go of the holding hands and everything and just open to ascend. So, you know, we're meant to have a joyful experience while we perceive ourselves within perception. But, you know, there was an old bumper sticker, life's a bitch and then you die. Uh, actually, it's the way the awakening goes. Life's a joy and then you ascend. That's what this is all about. You have to first go into the joy. You're not going into ascending. Or some of you might have seen that movie Transcendence with Johnny Depp. You're not going into the unified field, which the internet kind of represented in that, going into this higher intelligence until you experience a joy. You don't go to eternal life through death. You go to eternal life through waking, through forgiveness. So... It's just like, it's so great because there's so many movies, there's so many tools, there's so many experiences that are available to, to find that joy. Even the Bible said, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Well, I think that has a lot to do with, with finding your heart song, like in the Penguin movie. Uh, it, it does, when you find your center, you find your core, you hit your stride, you hit your rhythm, you know, you find something that just is wanting to come through you that feels so good and so right, and you are willing to let go of all the naysayers, all the, all the, those that say you can't do that, to tell you no, and so on and so forth, and, and really going for it. And just looking and honestly facing everything in your mind that would, that would be an obstacle, that would say you can't. I mean, really, honestly, the only obstacle is fear. And I think for myself, there was a point in my life, I think I was in my 20s, where I honestly 
decided to take a look at the motivations in my mind. And I said, how much of my life, as David in, in my 20s, how much of my life is motivated by fear? How much of my life is motivated by survival? Am I taking jobs because I find them inspiring, or am I doing it because of fear? What my parents might think, whether I'll survive in society, and so on and so forth. We have to let that inspiration in us, that love in us, be our motivating factor. So that everything you do in your life, from, from the relationships you're drawn to, from the task you're drawn to, from the, the things in this world that, that seem to be have a draw for you to put your, your mind's attention into, you know, it, it's a journey of, of being on the cutting edge of inspiration. You know, in our community, it's you could, Jason and uh, Jeffrey have been sharing. They've had this inspiration for film and filmmaking. And you said you went to an Akashic reading. Yeah. And you were told to write. He was told to write. The last thing that he would ever have thought to hear in an Akashic reading was that he was to write. He was always waiting for the writer to show up. <laughs> Who's going to be the writer? Who's going to write a script? I'll make a movie. Who's going to be the writer? And then you were told that. And then Jeffrey's answering his call, getting into just the nuances of what is it? How am I to be used? There you are, sitting close to the cameras now. That's just like a symbol. It's like it's, it's coming in, like the Spirit knows the way. And the Spirit knows what Joseph Campbell was saying, follow your bliss. You know, it was an amazing thing that Joseph Campbell said, follow your bliss. Isn't that the opposite of everything we've ever heard and learned in the world? I mean, most of us didn't really, we weren't raised with parents as we're sitting at the dinner table said, whatever you're going to do, it doesn't matter. Just follow your bliss. Can you imagine <laughs> that? But that, that's what the Spirit is, is actually telling us on the inside, you know. We really are to do that. We have, our skills and abilities will be channelized in a, in a wonderful direction that it's not about even the skills and the abilities. They'll be channelized into a, a state of mind. It will take us into an awareness. And that's what's been the whole point. Not to achieve something, not to conquer anything, not to like leave a legacy for future generations. There are no future generations. That's part of the trick too, that there's future generations. Didn't a lot of us grow up in households and everything that says sacrifice for future generations? sacrifice for future generations. What kind of message is that? Oh, it'll be hard on you, but the future generations will benefit. No, that's still part of a trick, that there's some kind of a thing out there in the future that we should keep focused on and just grin and bear it and struggle and strive and do all this so that the future, you know, will bring something brighter. I, for most of us, that was something, at least there was something optimistic and hopeful about it will get better in the future. But, if you get to A Course in Miracles, you get all the way through, deeper into the text, Jesus has a section called The Immediacy of Salvation, in which Jesus Christ says, Be not content for future happiness, for it is not your just reward, for you have cause for freedom now. He's still zooming us into the present moment. He's still telling us, don't even go for future happiness. As much as that was sentimentally kind of there, it's not good enough. So the whole book is really saying, you know, you have a calling, you have a part to play in the plan, and if you answer the call and really go for it, you will start to feel the joy. That's how you'll know when you're zooming into God's will. It's through the joy. And the more consistent that joy becomes, the more you, you know you are on the homing beacon. You are in the rescue. You personally haven't done anything, but your mind is being rescued by this, the Holy Spirit. Lifted out of this dark, shrouded sleep, guilt, pain, suffering. And it does actually come back to starting to realize that you have to change the purpose, and it's, it's, there's no amount of efforting in the form that is actually going to get you there. It's, that's, even that kind of effort will fall away in the end with the state of acceptance.
is it just on our movie watchers guide to enlightenment you know it's like it's been such a devotion to go into this waking up now that that what has come as a reflection of this devotion is now mwge.org is is a pathway to god people talk about meditation as a pathway to god prayer you know all these different kind of techniques now there's a way to actually use movies to wake up we just went through an experience together but with the commentaries, with the setups, and with some of those teachings like Time's End, Time's End is just uh, one of those unspeakably amazing parables of moving into the light, moving into abstraction, of, of stopping this hope of trying to, to <clears throat> break memories apart into two categories, the good memories and the bad memories. Because there has to be something beyond that. As they say at the end of Solaris, we don't have to think like that anymore. Am I dead? Am I alive? We don't <laughs> have to think like that anymore. That's that's really transcending the outcomes of the world. Yeah. We are in the homing beacon. <laughs> Anybody have any huge insights with this movie? I don't, but I'm glad that you were able to interpret it for me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's Touched by an Angel series. I bought all nine seasons. And you can, whatever emotion you've got in the day, you can like let the spirit pick one for you. And it's sometimes a good teaching metaphor, too. I cry at nine out of ten of them. So. <laughs> <laughs> when I cry, I'm like, pick the right one. <laughs> yeah. The way the world is set up is, you know, Jesus even used the word in the Course called the riddle. Everyone on earth, every human being is trying to solve the riddle of their life. And riddle is a very interesting word for Jesus Christ using to describe a human life. A human life, if we took one symbol from the keyboard of a keyboard of a computer, a human life would be a question mark. <coughs> Not an I. It'd be a question mark. The ego asks the first question. In heaven, there's no questions. It's just pure bliss, pure love, pure joy. The ego asks the very first question, what am I? It's a question of identity. If you are a holy child of God and you're questioning that, that is what Jesus calls a question on a scale that you can't even imagine. If the one thing that you could ever know is yourself as a child of God, and you're questioning the only thing that you could ever know, you've just set up a riddle. And your entire life in, on earth is nothing more than an unsolvable riddle. There will never be an answer on earth to the question of what is my life for? I use that example many times where Ken Wapnick says, I was I was doing the dishes, I think listening to a cassette tape by Ken Wapnick one time, and, and somebody asked Ken, what does the Course say about life on other planets? And Ken said, the Course says there's no life on this planet. <laughs> now why is there no life on this planet? Because everything is a question mark. Every person is a question mark. Every leaf is a question mark. Every blade of grass is a question mark. Everything in this world of fragmentation and separation is a question mark. Everything that you perceive is a riddle that has no answer. There's one point in the Course, if you go far enough deep into it, and you go deep enough with it, it will say that all of the roadways of the world lead to death. Why? Because they're question marks. Come on, tell me a blade of grass will lead to death? Absolutely, because fragmented perception is the denial of wholeness. And if you believe anything, even a blade of grass exists in and of itself, apart from everything else, imagine you just take that little shred of something and you give it a name, grass, blade of grass, and you carve it out of the entire cosmos. That's what the separation is. That's what the fear of awakening is, is fear of losing everything that you believe is real and true, of losing all the, the question marks. So awakening is really about surrendering and coming up every single day where you wake up and you go, 
you need to show me. I am not seeing clearly. I've been hallucinating. I've been, I've got an imagination run wild <laughs> here <coughs> that's gone way far from divine love into fragmented perception. Recently, I was down in uh, Australia this year, and I'm, I was in a car, and I was going to go out to lunch with some friends, and I'm in the car, and in Australia, you know, the steering wheel's on the, the right-hand side, so I'm sitting in the passenger side, and we're driving down the road, and it's some man out there with one of these weed, professional weed whackers that's cutting the grass, and he's cutting the grass on the side as, my, as the car is going by, and I'm just in there, windows up and everything, and all of a sudden, a rock comes out from the weed racker at a high speed, right at the glass window where I am in the passenger side. And boom! I'm doing one of my talks, I'm doing a discussion, and boom! The, the rock hits, and the glass just starts... You know, it doesn't go through the window, it just starts breaking up into thousands and tens and thousands and literally, probably millions, I mean, it went, and it just went like this, and I continued my talk. <laughs> the people in the car were just like, and I was, I was making a point. It was a very important point. I was, I was not to be distracted by rocks and shattered glass and everything. I, was, I, don't, I don't fall for these kind of pictures. So they, they were like, at the end, they were like, and you continued right on. The, the one in the back, Tia was in the back, I think, and Sam, and they were like, you didn't break a stride, you didn't even pause, you just continued on, and as the driver's like pulling the car over, and anyway, as we pull the car over, you can literally hear the glass going, it's still splintering, you can hear it, and we get out of the car, it's just splintering, splintering into tinier pieces, and tinier and tinier, fragmenting, 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 that's what this cosmos is, it's just... Look at the advertising, look at the explosion of images, you know, think back to the day of many centuries ago when out on a farm and there might have been animals and this and this, but look at the way cities and advertising and internet and cable, all it is is an explosion of images, it's just, it's just shattering, it's just going more and more into tiny, tiny pieces. There's not going to be a, you're not going to find a solution <laughs> in that shattering glass. In fact, they finally, you know, came along, and, and a guy came along, and he said, "Here, let me help you out." And they literally had to say, "Stand aside." And they just took a like a hammer, and they kept, but they had to bust it. It was one of these kind of things that's not meant to fall in on you. So it just kept, it just kept splintering until the guy finally came with a hammer and to try to knock it out of there and knock every piece of glass out, so we could continue on with an empty, <laughs> with a hole in the side of our. Uh, where the window was, but but to me that was like that was an amazing metaphor because you could even hear it continue to splinter. So some people say, is the world getting worse? No. Is the world getting any better? No. It's just completely neutral. But when we give it meaning, when we still believe there's good memories and bad memories and good outcomes and bad outcomes, we're simply making real in awareness something that has no meaning whatsoever. It's like a cracked glass. I, I like any kind of answer that doesn't judge something good or bad, but simply sees the value of the mirror. You've been hearing all this stuff about Donald Trump. The best answer I've ever heard when somebody asked Deepak Chopra about Donald Trump he said, what do you think about Donald Trump and this and for president and all this and this and this? He said, oh, well, very, very good. He is, he is reflecting all of our unconscious thoughts to us. It's so wonderful. He is he's showing us everything we do not want to look at. <laughs> you know? And the guy said, well, maybe he is, but I'm certainly not going to vote for him as my president. Well, that is part of the collective decision. We shall see what that is. You see? <laughs> there was nothing there. <laughs> nothing there, positive or negative. You know, we shall see what the collective decision is, you know? And it's a perfect reflection. So you, it's totally neutral. 
There is no person, place, thing, event, anything that means anything. But if you if you give it meaning, then then you're you're in hell. <laughs> you give meaning to the meaninglessness, and then it goes in hell. So the course starts off with lesson number one: nothing I see means anything. He's going to take us back into reclaiming the power of our whole mind, our holistic mind by coming back to a clearing of perception to see the world in a holistic way. And and that should be the, the thing. Why would you not see the simplicity of a course where lesson 79 is let me recognize the problem so it can be solved, and lesson 80 is let, let me recognize my problems have been solved. That's pretty good. Well, have already been solved. But as long as I'm still picking apart things, and I'm saying, this is good, this is bad, this is right, this is wrong, this is ethical, this is not ethical. Who am I to judge? Who set up all this judgment? Certainly not God. And it's our, that's the whole point of everything, is to see that, not that you should stop judging, but that you've never been capable of judging anything ever, because God didn't set it up. You know, I don't have to play by those rules. That will make you indescribably happy to have no opinions. What is your opinion about this prime minister? What is your opinion about the pollution? What's your opinion about this workshop? What's your opinion about this person? I don't know. Be honest. Just say, I don't know. <laughs> that's not wrong. That's not bad. It's good to not know. So, to me, this is really good stuff. It's a good experience. <laughs> I had a girlfriend year, years ago, and we used to love to go to Indian restaurants and just talk. We were talking in Indian dialect, and we'd go back and forth, and the well, world had no much fun. So it comes handy. All that comes in handy now for Deepak's non judgment lesson. <laughs> There's a lot of really wonderful non dualistic teaching, but what one of the most helpful aspects about the Course in Miracles is that it gives you the the construct of a concept of guidance. So, if you believe in judgment, which is what the human condition is, then why not let the Holy Spirit judge for you? Why not say to the Holy Spirit, decide for God for me? Here's my day. It's an open blank slate. What would you have me do? Where would you have me go? Who would you have me talk to? Who would you have me call on the phone or on Skype or who would you have me hug? What would you have me do today? In other words, if I'm going to unwind from a system of judgment, then maybe there is one who has a higher perspective that can give it to me, that can literally inform you moment by moment, day by day, and how wonderful it is to be in alignment, to be in that alignment with Source, with Presence. When you have learned how to decide with God, all decisions become as easy and as right as breathing. And it will be as if you are carried down a quiet path in summer. That's what Jesus tells us. Carried down a quiet path in summer. We can relate to that. Here we have a, some quiet paths in, in summer. That's the incentive for tuning in. That's the incentive for clearing away the, the obstacles so that you can tune in and hear the voice. And, and that guidance has only one purpose, is to unwind your mind out of guilt. It has no other purpose. In fact, there comes a point of stillness where you don't need guidance anymore. You know, it's just total acceptance of what is. Total stillness. There's no need to to even ask for help, because there's a recognition of who you are. David, do you see everything as a dream? And if so, what does that look like? It's very surreal. It's like that's the experience of, of dreaming. There's, there's a sense of just observing and watching, but there's, there's not a sense that anything is ever out of place. Mm -hmm. So, so there's not, even in a lot of Buddhist terms, sometimes they'll talk about right action. I heard a, a Course in Miracles friend recently uh, gave a talk on Course in Miracles and right action. 
the Course is talking about right-mindedness and alignment and right thinking. And, he, and Jesus does say, what you do comes from what you think. But the focus is totally on that alignment in thoughts, to be in that stream of thoughts to fill the Spirit. And so, in, in that sense, it's like everything is, is unified. So it's, it's not, you're not breaking the world into the past, present, future thing anymore. Jason was talking about having no ambition. Yes, in, in the happy dream there is no ambition. So if there are plans that you're given or things that you're guided to say or do or even set up, there's no investment in those is in terms of outcomes. You don't really have a sense of anticipation. You have more I would say just contentment. So it's not like you're anticipating what's to come. And you see how different that is from the human condition. Humans working jobs that they don't like and TGIF, thank God it's Friday, anticipating vacations. You know, oh, here's my calendar, get my iPhone out. How many more? I've only got seven more months to go till my vacation. You know, that there's such a future focus to co- overcome a sense of despair or a sense of depression, a sense of kind of a, a mundane, low-grade sadness. Kind of like that McCartney song. Do, 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 do. It's just another day. It's got a, there's a melancholy in that song, It's Just Another Day. Like going through the motions. Another day of surviving on planet Earth. You know, where's the joy in that? But when there's a sense of purpose, when you really give yourself over to that purpose, when you, you're aware that what you're doing, you're doing for the whole universe, then then that moment and that purpose take on a fullness where you feel like the whole universe is with you, is, is your mind. And so there's nothing out of place in that. There's nothing, nothing that needs to be fixed or changed. There's no problems in that. That's the, the value of that experience. The human condition is just seems like every day there's a whole set of problems and you do the best that you can do with that set. Every day comes with its own set of problems. And then you go to sleep at night and already when you're trying to fall off to sleep sometimes you, you're still rehashing the unsolved problems or you're thinking about problems of the next day. How am I going to deal with that? Tossing and turning. Last night I didn't get to sleep at all. No, no. The sleeping pill I took was just a waste of time. I couldn't close my eyes because you were on my mind. And by last night, I didn't get to sleep. No, I didn't get to sleep at all. You know, it's hard to even sleep when you've got problems worrying through your mind. And again... <laughs> It may seem like you've got a lot of problems on a lot of different levels, like the dam's breaking and you're just plugging a little clay here and there every day to try to keep as much water out as possible. But we're coming back to that riddle thing. What if the only problem is that riddle of identity? It's still trying to play small, trying to play human, when you have a spiritual reality that's being denied. And those little question marks just keep popping up every day. Back to guidance. Yeah, six weeks ago I retired and because I was guided to. I started I was at work, I was sitting in meetings and thinking, what am I doing here? These people are making up all these rules and making others suffer. And, you know, I started seeing myself sitting at my desk thinking, this is such a waste of time. And I loved my job. I loved the people I worked with. And yeah, then I got sick for four days at work. And I thought, this is spirit telling me, this is it. You've got to make a decision. You've got to go. And of course, other people said to me, did you go to the doctor? And I said, no, I wasn't sick. And that way, I, it was internal. It wasn't something I could explain to them. 
And I thought, you know, I could be studying the Course, you know, and just wasting your time here, you know, going through all these emotions and suffering, you know what I mean? And now I'm tired and finding other distractions. You know, even though I'm studying it every day and every night, I'll sort of think, oh, it's such a nice day, I want to go out, you know, and distract myself. I've had enough of this now. And, and in the last week, ego is really heavily fighting with me, and it's giving me the struggle to, you know, to stay vertical. Yeah, it's, instead of retiring, maybe you could think of it as, as you are repurposing your life, like you are clarifying and allowing the Holy Spirit to purify the purpose for everything. And so there are no accidents that when things seem to come to an end, even employment, uh, you still will face the same mind training issues that you would or that you were working is still going to be there, but now this repurposing, you know, it's really like the prayer of your heart saying, come into my life, come into my mind, come into my heart, inspire me, lift me up. And I think one of the nice things about these kind of retreats is you meet mighty companions, you get exposed to tools, you get exposed to possibilities, and those are like seeds. The Holy Spirit's just planting a lot of seeds. And a number of them will germinate because you have a spaciousness, you know, because you care that they germinate, because you water the seeds, you want them to have sunlight, you want, you want them to germinate. I think the most difficult thing in the spiritual journey is this feeling of aloneness, like somehow we have to, we're all alone in the universe, and even though the Spirit is saying it's, all, it's your lesson and everything that's happening it's all for your mind. It's not in a personal way, but when we believe that we personally have to solve the riddle, which the riddle is set up on the personal, it's unsolvable. But you know, I think that's the power of of joining. That's the thing that I've always enjoyed with doing these kind of retreats and gatherings. Is I know there's a a much greater plan of work where people who are meant to meet are meeting, where things are meant to ignite, or meant to be inspired. You know, with a lot of our ministry as we've gone along, we basically, we got into doing like Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment, not only the book, but then putting it online. We did things, mystical mind training program, because we met people, I met people around the world that said, I don't know anybody else who studies the course, or I live in a remote area, and there's no one around me. They would say things like, I live in the Bible Belt of the United States. I live in Mississippi, where there's no course activity anywhere near and everything. But, but it was like, well, you can link up even through the Internet, and you can have a mind training partner. They may not live in Mississippi, but they're there. The thing will be given when that's the prayer of the heart. So to me, that's part of this celestial speed up, is... is overcoming and transcending this sense of of aloneness because that's that's when things seem most overwhelming when you feel like you're you're in it entirely on your own and ultimately like even in the, the mini movie there it had to transfer he he basically the father and son were not really communicating it was the mother that was the bridge you know that's that kind of talked to both of them and then the father taking the son on the trip was the crack of opening. You saw the big smile on the son's face, like, oh, I get to go with dad on a trip. And then it was pretty extreme. <laughs> that was a very extreme trip. But it, it came around to a, a sense of equality and, yeah, healing and respect and everything. So it's a nice little miniature story of how, how it can go. I always say too, my feeling is when we when I meet people, I feel like everyone that I meet out of on planet Earth, that we are brought together for a very holy purpose and that we are lifelong companions along the way. And that's what what it is. You know, we, we have not come together by accident. 
but this, there's a very important reason. Also, I, I'm always one in favor of retirement. I took early retirement uh, in my <laughs> 20s because uh, I had a very important purpose that was so important that I thought, okay, Jesus didn't really have to twist my arm to take retirement, you know, in my late 20s. It was more of like, um, it, was, it was a leap of faith because uh, I still had lingering thoughts of careers and attaining something and achieving something and making something happen and money doesn't grow on trees. And, well, we had all those back and forth discussions. But actually, I'm always happy to hear that people are retiring from the world because everything is an opportunity to learn divine trust. I call it divine providence, that everything that is needed is provided. But it just comes in what the world would call unconventional ways. Whereas the world's all about, you have to handle your survival on your own. That, you know, nobody else is going to do it for you, so you have to do it. And that can be very stressful, too. So I think our collaborative efforts have, have been amazing in seeing things start to show up and things working out in amazing ways, miraculous ways, but not ways that any of us could have predicted. We are constantly finding ourselves looking at each other going, can you believe this? You know, it's almost like a pinch me. You believe what we're experiencing and we could have never seen anything going this way. I had no inclinations. I didn't even know what A Course in Miracle was. I didn't know what spiritual awakening was. I think back in in the parable of David in the late 20s, you know, I'm just coming out of graduate school. I don't know what the world holds for me. I'm not very ambitious, but yet I don't want to waste my life. I'm just full of questions. And a crack of openness, and then A Course in Miracles drops into my lap, and I go, just opening, and hmm, something is going on here. Something important. It's a change in life direction. It's it's going to be completely different than anything that I ever. You know, I could feel all those kind of things, like seeds germinating inside of me, and I didn't even know where it was going. But like the sun, there, I just jumped right off the cliff. Just <laughs> here we go. It's been Robert Browning's poem, "The Road Less Traveled." Two roads diverged in the woods, and I, I took the one less traveled by. I took the not the well-worn, beaten-down path, but the seemingly rare path, the one less traveled by, Christ-inspired, the way that's straight and narrow, he said in the Bible, I took that road, and that has made all the difference. That's what lights us up. So you're not alone on this journey. I have a mighty companion that's uh, my lifesaver, <laughs> and we met we met by accident. So you know, I know there are no accidents, yeah. and I'm so grateful. Maybe there are more now. And today I've had so many miracles because I've had lots of questions because of ego, and you've answered every one. It's like. Yeah, isn't that amazing? You just, you, just you showed up. Yeah, people like that. They they sometimes they they don't even have a chance to write it down or speak it out, and it's like tick 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 tick. Oh wow, that's interesting. I had those, and then tick 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 tick. You get answered. It's a time saver. <laughs> to come together in this purpose, you go light years ahead. What learning that could have taken thousands of years, and you go to bed at night. Hmm, my direction is shifting in a good way here. And then you just feel it. Yeah. So good. I guess I just have this fear that ego is, you know, like coming over here, you know, into my heart and I'm trying to push back and it keeps coming and goes <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and it's back again with a vengeance. Yeah, my friend Sam, when I first met her I was over in Manchester and I I went to do a gathering in Manchester, England, and she told me much, much later that she said when she sat down with the whole group of people in a circle, she heard this clear and distinct voice in her mind 
that said to her, you are going to die. That's the, <laughs> when she came to one of my gatherings. <laughs> and so I said, what did you do when the boy said, you are going to die? She said, I, it took everything for me. I stayed through the whole thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be here. I'm going to be here. I'm going to listen. I'm going to hear. You know, but it was almost like the ego, which is like, oh, it kind of is like a spider that hides, hides in the dark crevices of your mind. But when you come close to something that is like a direct pointer to the light, it, the little spider comes out and just like, who's in, who's boss here? You are going to die. But, but she didn't really follow her voice. She's just taken steps and more steps and more steps to come in deeper, closer. To go for it, you know, even though it was almost like the ego was saying, fair warning, I'm going to tell you something. Now, when you study the Course, you know, the ego doesn't know what it wants, and the ego doesn't like the thought of its own death, because the ego wants to exist. So, Jesus has a line in the Course where it says, the ego will pursue you beyond the grave. That doesn't sound very good. <laughs> that sounds like a Freddy Krueger <laughs> uh, movie, only worse than a Freddy Krueger movie, this puff of something that's going to pursue you beyond the grave. In other words, you can't die to escape it. It's just going to be waiting for you, even beyond the grave, to get you. Because I told you. It, yeah, <laughs> I told you so, and this and this, and the ego's goal is help. And so... It, it does have a, a clear-cut goal, and it is hell. And it's always hell in the future, you know. It wants, that's why, you know, it, it doesn't mind suicide, because it's going to keep pushing for its goal. And eternal life is showing that there is no hell, that, that it cannot be a goal. And yet, when the mind keeps playing this identity game, it still pursues this crazy goal. So I think for us to say resign now, you know, as your own teacher, that to me that just reminds me how we have to, we just have to follow. We have to be willing to trust and follow. I was like in Risen last night when Clavius kept asking all the disciples, well, what's happening? Why did he show up now? He's like, we're followers, man. We don't know. We just follow. <laughs> they just keep yeah. doing whatever Jesus tells them to do. Yeah. I like when it was in, he was really pushing hard with that one apostle, like, you know, where is he? Where is he? If you tell me where he is, I will let you go. Yeah, right. And he's like, so you'll let me go free if I, if I tell you where he is? And he's like, yes. He is everywhere and shoots out the door. <laughs> Is that, is that an answer? <laughs> Absolutely shoots out the door after delivering He is Everywhere. Almost like, you're asking me the greatest question? And you're going to set me free? If, I, if you allow me the great honor to tell you the answer? <laughs> and then the, the room is there. Yeah. <laughs> That was one of the turning point, though. Those things add up. In the end, that's that was there, you know. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, his innocence was beautiful. Yeah, everyone can relate to a story of convincing, like of total disbelief and totally just trying to see things in the way the world sees them, and then and then being proven wrong, <laughs> and yet giving way to that, going like, "Oh my God, thank God, <laughs> I was wrong." Yeah. Thank God I was wrong about this identity chase. There's one book that we had, I got years ago called The Peace of God is My Own Goal. And we had these two Course in Miracles students and teachers going around, and, you know, they would just accept what was given. And they were given two beautiful harps, but they didn't know how to play the harps. <laughs> so they ended up carrying the harps with them, and they went into this church. I think it was a Unity Church. Is the way the parable goes. And they, they just would get in there and they would strum a little, but they didn't know how to play the harps. And then they're giving this talk on A Course in Miracles, and then the, the wife, Barbara Varley, at one point, 
turns to the audience, to the whole congregation, and says, Tonight, my husband Robert and I are going to play the harps. <laughs> and the look on Robert's face <laughs> is like, How dare you promise? I mean, what has gotten into you, woman? You know, it was just. And then they both came and they just got their hands to the side, and the spirit came through and played the most glorious song. It just, the spirit just channeled through them. They just had the willingness. They didn't have, didn't have the, the skill. experience, skill, anything. But they, they were just used. And I, I did have a friend, Donna Marie Carey, too, who, who took down many, many great songs from the Spirit in the beautiful albums. But she did tell me that there was one time where she was on a stage and she went up and she got the microphone, she hit her guitar, and then she channeled. An original song, an entire original song, just purely channeled it out of pure willingness. And at the end of the song, she came off and her, her husband, Brian, was just like going, when did you write that one? <laughs> oh my God, that was that's one of the best songs you have ever written. And she kind of got him to the side and said, did you record that? And he said, no. She said, I didn't write that song. <laughs> it just came. That was that was a one time. <laughs> Nobody recorded it and everything, and it just came through. And you know, you, musicians do that sometimes with jam sessions, where they're just feeling the vibe and the rhythm, and they feel in all the love, and then amazing things can come through. But it's purely in the moment. It's not something that's prearranged or thought about, preconceived. It's just there. And to me, that's another symbol of how we're meant to live our life. We don't. Always have to keep rehearsing, planning. I do talks. I've been doing talks for 30 years, and and I just I don't ever write them down. I don't plan them. I don't prepare them. Doesn't matter whether it's a, a small group or a whole auditorium full. It's the same thing. Tony asks them to write out what his talks are going to be, and they have to be identical. Two talks in <laughs> session. He's like, well, I can channel this paragraph to tell you. But both talks are totally different. But Tony's happy. <laughs> he gets it's just good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can't. It, more and more, that's just the way your life is. It's totally spontaneous, totally given. Yeah.